Okay, this is the uh, Year 12 uh, Structured Mock Paper. So the first question, you're given the speed v of a transverse variable in a uniform string is given by this equation. Um, interestingly, this is actually the uh, usually the equation for uh, weight, the, the velocity of a wave on a, spring, on a string. Um, so you might notice this equation is actually required on some examples, but not on yours. So you can see they've given you the full equation here and explained what everything means. So you've got the measurements with some uncertainties, and the first thing you're asked to do is measure an appropriate, so to state an appropriate instrument to measure uh, the length L. So L we would be, we would expect to be in the range of probably about uh, 30 to maybe 300 centimeters. Um, so for something like that, you would be looking for a, a meter rule or a tape measure. You can't say a ruler, just a ruler, because normally a ruler is about 30 centimeters, and that'd be too short to measure this. Use the data in figure 1.1 to calculate the speed v. All right, so quite a simple one. We're just going to start with the equation. I can substitute directly into it. Uh, so v is the square root. Now, I've, I notice here it says it wants v in meters per second. Um, so I'm going to rewrite uh, these terms here. So this one will become 0 0.0051 grams, uh, and this one will become 1.26 meters. Uh, so this becomes the square root of uh, 1.8 multiplied by 1.26 uh, divided by Five, uh, 0.0051 uh, and when you plug that into a calculator you should get 21.1 uh, and obviously that's in meters per second. Part 2, uh, use your answer above and the data in the table to determine the value of V with its absolute uncertainty to an appropriate number of significant figures. Okay, so for the first thing, for the significant figures, um, we are going to be looking for one sig fig here because all of these are to one sig fig. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is I've already, it's already been given as uh, per, as percentage uncertainty, um, so it's quite easy to do that. Um, so what I'm doing, I'm multiplying together uh, T and L. So when I multiply numbers, you add the percentage uncertainties. So that's going to be 5 plus 1. And then dividing by M, and remember also if you divide, you add the percentage uncertainties. So it becomes 5 plus 1 plus 2. And then I'm square rooting it. So if you remember, if you square something, then you, oh, sorry, if you raise something to a power, then you multiply the percentage uncertainty by that power. So I'm raising that to the power of a half. So that becomes 5 plus 1 plus 2 plus a half, uh, which is 8 divided by 2. So that's 4%. So it is 21.1 plus or minus 4%. So to get the absolute uncertainty, um, I will uh, multiply this by 0 0.004. Uh, so let's uh, call that the uncertainty in V is 21.1 multiplied by 0 uh, 0.04 uh, and that comes out as uh, 0 0.84 uh, but remember we said that we need to do it to uh, two to sorry to one significant figure um, for our uncertainty. I can give uh, V to 3 sig fig because uh, L is to 3 sig fig and the others are to 2, so uh, 3 significant figures is appropriate. Uh, so my final answer will be 21.1 plus or minus 0 0.8.
question two was all about uh, moving things through fluids. So we should be thinking straight away, when you see something immersed in a fluid, you should be thinking, OK, I'm going to have uh, up thrust and I'm going to have viscous drag going on. Uh, so it gives you the setup and then uh, nicely described as well in a uh, diagram. Then it tells you the cylinder has a weight of 0.4 newtons, height h, and circular cross-section area of 0.031 meters. Nice to say that's in meters because uh, that's going to save us a conversion. Density of water, uh, okay, good. That's in uh, base units as well, which is handy. Uh, the pressure, the differences in pressure on the top and bottom faces of the cylinder is 520 pascals. So the first thing you're asked to do is to calculate the height of the cylinder. Um, there's probably a couple of different ways that you could do this. Um, Actually, no, sorry, there's only one because the density is about that. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, if you remember, we are asked for, uh, we've got the d difference in pressure. Um, so here you have a pressure at the top uh, and here you have a pressure at the bottom. Uh, so if you remember the difference in pressure, uh, that will be uh, rho gh, where rho is density of the water. Um, so I can say, uh, let's write this equation again, delta p is rho of the liquid gh. Uh, so delta p is 520, because good, they left that in pascals. Uh, so that is equal to uh, 1.0 times 10 to the 3, multiplied by g, which is 9.81, multiplied by h, which is what we're trying to find. Sorry, um, Yes, we talk, we're talking, yes, sorry, H. Um, rearrange that equation and you should get H is uh, 0.053. Obviously, that's in meters. Show that the up thrust acting on the cylinder is 0.39 newtons. Um, so again, a couple of different ways you could do this. You could think about uh, the Archimedes principle of volume of water displaced. Um, but the easiest thing to do is say that uh, I know that the, the higher pressure will be at the bottom. So on the bottom here, um, I have a, a difference in pressure of uh, 520 pascals and I know that pressure is force multiplied by area. Um, they've given me the area quite nicely there, there's the cross-sectional, uh, sorry, diameter uh, there. Um, so I can say that uh, 520 uh, is equal to uh, the force, which is what I'm trying to find, that's the upthrust, uh, multiplied by uh, pi r squared, which is the uh, cr the area. Uh, so that would be pi times 0 0.031 over 2, because this is a diameter, uh, all squared. Uh, so that, uh, when we rearrange to get uh, f, uh, we should get, sorry, pressure is force divided by area, isn't it? There we go, I was wondering what, what was going wrong there. Uh, so force will be 520 multiplied by pi, lots of 0 0.031 over 2 all squared. Plug that into your calculator uh, and you should get uh, 0 0.39. Part three, calculate the tension T in the string. Um, so this diagram is getting a little bit messy, so I'm just going to uh, redraw it, I think. Um, so we have uh, a force due to the up thrust, uh, which is 0 0.39 newtons. Uh, and we also have a weight acting on it, which is 0 0.84 newtons. Um, initially, it's not moving, so we've got no other forces acting on it. Um, so, well, apart from the tension, sorry. Uh, so if it's at rest, I can say that the resultant force in it is zero. Uh, therefore, tension will just be the difference in those two. So it'll be 0 0.84 take away 0 0.39 which is 0 0.45 newtons. 
Part B, the string is now used to move the cylinder in A vertically upwards through the water. The variation with time t on the velocity is shown below. So the first thing you're asked to do is uh, use it to find the acceleration uh, in the first two seconds. Um, or at time t equals 2. Now you can see it's not varying, so actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the, uh, the acceleration throughout this whole section here is constant, uh, so I can just use the gradient. Uh, so I can say acceleration is change in v over time taken. Uh, the change in v is 10.0 centimeters per second. Uh, I'm asked this in meters per second, so let's rewrite that actually as uh, 0.100 meters. Uh, and I'm doing that in 2.5 seconds. Yeah, and just bash that into a calculator. Uh, and you should come out with uh, 4.0 times 10 to the negative 2 meters per second. Part 2. The top face of the cylinder is at a depth of 0.32 meters below the surface of the water at time t is equal to 0. Use figure 2.2 to determine the depth of the top face below the surface of the water at time t is 0.4 seconds. Okay. Um, so it's moving upwards through the water um, so we're going to say that we were going to expect this uh, so we're going to expect uh, the uh, depth what they're asking for for depth okay I'm going to call depth uh, let's call it capital D um, so I'm going to expect first of all a depth of less than 0.32 that's just something that I can uh, just have in the back of my mind um, and I know that I'm interested in these cross-sectional areas. So I'm going to split this into two triangles, A and B. Um, so let's just say that the distance A, that will be a half base times height. Uh, so that will be a half multiplied by 2.5 multiplied by 0 0.100, because remember we want it to be in meters. Uh, area B, that will be, uh, again, it's a triangle, so it's a half times uh, the base of this one is 1.5 seconds, and again, the same height, 0 0.100. Zero. Uh, plug those into your calculator, um, and you should get a distance. So A plus B, the two distances uh, will be 0 0.20 meters. Um, so I need to subtract that from the current depth because I'm going upwards. Uh, so I can say my depth will be 0 0.32 take away 0 0.20. Uh, and that comes out as 0 0.12 meters. So again, I've just done my little sanity check there. Yes, I am less than uh, 0.32 meters. Part C. Cylinder in B is released from the string at time t is 4 seconds. The cylinder falls from rest vertically downwards through the water. Uh, assume that the upthrust acting on the cylinder remains constant as it falls. State the name of the force that acts on the cylinder when it is moved and does not act on the cylinder when it is stationary. Um, so that force is the viscous force or viscous drag force. You needed the word viscous in there. So why couldn't you just say drag? Well, viscous drag, uh, there, there are different types of drag um, that occur from different types of fluids um, or that can occur from different types of friction that go on. So this is a particular version of drag that occurs when something moves through a fluid that has a viscosity. So just be aware that you need to use that word viscous. Part two, state and explain the variation, if any, on the acceleration of the cylinder as it falls downwards through the water. Okay, so what we're looking for is the fact that as the speed increases, 
the viscous drag also increases. And then we need the idea of, okay, so therefore uh, the resultant force decreases. No mark for saying that, but uh, important for the uh, understanding. And then acceleration decreases as a result of less uh, overall force acting on it. Three part A, define acceleration. Um, so different couple of different ones you can have. Uh, the easiest one to say is it is the rate of change of velocity. Part B, a ball is kicked from horizontal ground towards the top of a vertical wall as shown. So they've actually drawn the path for us quite nicely. Uh, the horizontal distance between the initial position of the ball and the base of the wall is 24 meters. The ball is kicked with initial velocity v at an angle of 28 degrees to the horizontal. The ball hits the top of the wall after a time of 1.5 seconds. Air resistance may be assumed to be negligible. That is an important fact. So you're asked to calculate the initial horizontal component vx of the ball. So if I drew it like that, you're being asked for this v in the x direction. Now, because we're assuming that there's no air resistance, um, we're going to say that vx is a constant, uh, just as you do for most projectile questions. Um, so uh, vx is just going to be distance travelled over time taken, both of which we have. So that will be 24 uh, divided by 1.5 seconds, which is the time taken. Uh, so that comes out as 16 metres per second. Part two, show that the initial component Vy of the velocity of the ball is 8.5 meters per second. Uh, so what we have here is a, uh, a triangle um, and it's going to look something like this. So it's got an angle here of 28. Let me just check. Is that 28? It is 28 degrees. Um, and Vx we've already calculated as 16. Um, and this one is Vy. Um, so remembering your basic triangles, this is the adjacent, this is the opposite. So we can remember that tan of theta is equal to opposite over adjacent. So tan of 28 is equal to Vx over 16. Vx will be... 16 tan 28, uh, which is 8.5 meters per second. Part 3, calculate the time taken for the ball to reach its maximum height above the ground. As an easy way of working that out, at maximum height, the velocity will be 0 meters per second. So I'm just going to use the uh, the equation v is equal to u plus at. In this case the final velocity is 0. Initial velocity I've already calculated as 8.5 and uh, acceleration is 9.81 and I'm trying to find t. So I can say that the time taken is uh, 8.5, oh, I suppose actually it's probably minus 9.81, isn't it? Because it's reducing it, so that would make more sense. I think I'm going to get, uh, I don't want a negative time, um, and it is a, a negative acceleration. Uh, so it's, uh, sorry, uh, 8.5 over 9.81. Plug that into your calculator, and you get 0 0.87 seconds. Part 4. The ball is kicked at time t is 0. On the figure below, sketch the variation in time t with the vertical component vx, uh, sorry, vy until it hits the wall. So we're only doing the vertical component. So um, a couple of things to point out. I would expect the gradient uh, to be constant um, and to be 9.81. 
because it's accelerating the whole time. Uh, it may be assumed that the velocity is positive when it's in the upwards direction. So it starts uh, positive. Um, I would also expect it to become negative. So let's start putting these things on. So uh, at time t is zero, um, I know it should be 8.5. Um, so that's going to be somewhere about here. I'm not going to mark it super carefully, but um, obviously you should. And then the next easiest one to do is... Uh, what is the easiest way of doing it? Yeah, time taken for the ball to reach its maximum height. So when it reaches its maximum height, um, its uh, velocity will be zero, because that was the assumption that we used here. So maximum height will occur at uh, 0 0.87. Um, so that's going to be about, well, it's going to be exactly halfway between these here. Um, so you draw it something like that, um, and then you're going to join these up with a uh, sharp pencil and a ruler. Uh, one thing that's worth pointing out, um, we don't really know what happens to it past uh, time uh, 1.5 seconds, because 1.5 seconds is when it hits the... Oh, oh well that's very annoying. <laughs> is when it hits the... Uh, opposite wall. Uh, so we don't want to go past there. Now my computer is not wanting to draw this very well, so I'm just going to draw it freehand. Um, no, I'm not because that looks like a dog's breakfast. Let's try it again with a proper sh uh, straight line. Now behave yourself this time, please, computer. Okay, there we go. We're looking for something roughly like that. Obviously, it needs to be a little bit more uh, carefully drawn. Uh, from the mark scheme, um, they were looking for the line to start at 0 0.5 um, and cross the axis at uh, 0 0.870. So just check your line as a straight line that does that, and you should get both the marks. Part C, use the information in part B to determine the maximum height of the ball above the ground. So a bunch of different ways you could uh, approach this. Um, so you could say, well, first thing we need to say is that uh, this area under here, this will be the max height. Uh, because obviously once it gets to this point zero, it starts to come back down again. So if I find this area, um, I'll get the maximum height. Um, so you could use almost any of the SUVAT equations that have S in it. Um, I think probably just doing it as the straight area is probably the easiest. Um, so we can say height is equal to a half base times height. Um, I know that the base is 0 0.87 and I know that the height is uh, 0, sorry, uh, is 16. Uh, no, is it? Sorry, it's not 16, is it? Uh, what, was the, what was the horizontal component? Uh, sorry, 8.5. 8.5. Um, 16 was for the, the, the horizontal, wasn't it? Uh, 8.5. Just check that on a calculator. Yeah, that will work. Um, so you should get about uh, 3.7 metres. Maximum gravitational potential energy of the ball above the ground is 22 joules. Calculate the mass of the ball. Okay, so we know that gravitational potential energy is mgh. Um, we now know that maximum height is 3.7, so I can say 22 joules is equal to the mass I'm trying to find, multiplied by gravity, which is 9.81, multiplied by the maximum height, which is 3.7, so my mass will be 22 divided by 9.81 times 3.7, which comes out as 0 0.61 kilograms.
Question four. Uh, you're given a progressive wave and you're asked to, stent, to state what is meant by the period. Um, so a couple of different answers you can have here. Um, probably the, the, the most straightforward is uh, the time uh, taken for one complete oscillation. Uh, you could also have uh, the time between uh, two, or the time between two wave fronts um, or points that are in phase to pass a point, uh, like a, a physical location. Um, or you could have the uh, shortest time between two uh, wave fronts or points that are in phase passing a point. Uh, part two, you're asked for the uh, wave length. Um, so again, you could have the distance between two adjacent wave fronts. Um, or again, uh, points with identical phase. Um, or you could have the minimum distance between two wave fronts, the distance between two adjacent wave fronts. Um, or you can have uh, the distant minimum distance between two points having the same displacement and moving in the same direction. Of course, it would help if you could spell, uh, but that is also uh, an option. Any of those would be fine. Okay, part B. Figure 4.1 shows a variation with time t of the displacement x of two progressive waves p and q passing a point. The speed of the waves is 20 centimeters per second. Calculate the wavelength of the waves and you're asked for it in centimeters this time. Um, so I'm going to leave this in centimeters per second. Um, now that might be a bit of a red flag to you thinking, well, hang on, I've got two different waves. Why is it asking me for the, the wavelength of the waves? Um, but what you can see is uh, for wave P, uh, the, let's do it this way actually, the time period of wave P, uh, this goes from zero to 0 0.6 zero seconds. Uh, the time period of wave Q, uh, this goes from 0 0.20 to 0 0.80, so that's also 0 0.60 seconds. So actually these waves have the same frequencies, um, and as they have the same velocity, we're expecting them both to have uh, the same wavelength as well. So that's good. Um, so how am I going to find the wavelength? Well, I don't have this directly on here, so be very careful not to just read off because this is time, not distance. Um, so I'm going to start with V is equal to F lambda. Well, I don't have F, but I do have T, and I know that F is 1 over T, so I can say V is equal to lambda over T. Lambda is equal to V multiplied by T. Um, so that becomes uh, 20 centimeters per second multiplied by 0 0.60 seconds, which comes out as 12 centimeters. Part two, determine the phase difference between the two waves. Okay, so what I want to do now is calculate uh, the difference in uh, phase between the two, sorry, uh, yeah, phase between the two. So what's the easiest way of doing that? Um, so I could say between P and Q, uh, let's look at two identical points. So here I've got wave one coming up at this point, uh, on, sorry, on, on wave Q. Um, I've also got uh, wave P doing the same thing at 0 0.60 seconds. That's probably, yeah, that would be the easiest thing. So I'm going to find the uh, the change in time period. Um, so that's going to, so I can do a ratio um, of that to find uh, the, the phase between them. Um, so I can say that the phase difference is equal to uh, 0. 
to 0 uh, divided by 0 0.60 because that's where they cross on the axis um, and I need to multiply that by 360 degrees because I want this in uh, uh, a phase difference in degrees um, just plug that into a calculator that's 360 over sorry multiplied by 0 0.2 uh, divided by 0 0.6 uh, which comes out as 120 degrees now looking at those waves um, that's yeah that's definitely about what you would expect wouldn't you you can see that they're not completely overlapping so it's not 180 degrees uh, it's less than 180 degrees but it's still a fairly large uh, phase difference so 120 degrees seems reasonable Part three, calculate the ratio of the intensity of Q over the intensity of P. Um, so for this one, I'm going to use the fact that intensity is proportional to the amplitude squared. Um, and because this is just a straight ratio, I can therefore say uh, IQ over I, sorry, IP is equal to the amplitude of Q squared over the amplitude of p squared because i'm just dividing one by the other so even if there were some constants in here for the actual intensity they're going to disappear when i divide one by the other anyway um, so looking at this the maximum uh sorry the maximum amplitude of uh well, for q first or p first q first so the maximum intensity of q is uh, 0. sorry 2.0 centimeters and the maximum intensity of p is 3.0 centimeters i don't need to bother converting this into meters or anything like that um, because if you think about it well stroke first of all ratios don't actually care what um what measurement system you use if there was some constant here like say times 10 to the negative 2 to convert it into meters well i'm going to uh, multiply both top and bottom by 10 to the negative 2 so they'll just cancel so, so you could include it if you uh, don't feel too confident about uh, your maths or you're not sure there's you'll, you'll still get exactly the same answer um, but in this case it wasn't necessary to do any conversions there um, and this is a ratio so again I'm dividing one number um, with the same units by another one number with units by another number with the same units so there's no units in this all ratios are always dimensionless yeah anything in meters divided by something else in meters has no units Part four, the two waves superpose as they pass the same point. Uh, use figure 4.1 to determine the resultant displacement at a time t is 0 0.45. So let's look at this diagram. Uh, t is 0 0.45 is here. Um, so I can see that the uh, displacement of q will be 1 and the displacement of p will be minus 3. So remember for, to show superposition you just add the two together um, so you get 1 add minus 3 which comes out as minus 2. I do need the right number of significant figures I can read off from this graph to 2 sig fig um, so it should be uh, my, oh, sorry, this is asked for in. Oh, well, that's interesting. This is asking for it in millimeters. Um, oh, the X is in millimeters. Sorry, not centimeters. Um, so that's fine as well. Yeah, minus 2.00 millimeters. Question five. So a sound is detected by a microphone that is connected to a cathode ray oscilloscope, CRO. The trace on the screen of the CRO is shown in figure 5.1. Uh, so they've marked these here in centimetres, and hopefully the printing of the paper meant that they should match up to a centimetre, but even if they don't, you can uh, get that from the scale marked on here. Uh, the time base setting on the CRO is uh, sorry, 2.0 times 10 to the negative 5 seconds per centimetre. Uh, that's good that that's in per centimetre, because that means we don't have to do any conversion here. So the first thing you're asked to do is determine the frequency of the sound wave. So for that, we're going to say frequency is 1 over the time base. Um, I am not happy that this center is this uh, top is an absolute peak of a wave. Um, so I would say 
that what we can do is measure this distance because I can say this is definitely a trough, this is definitely a peak, so I can say this distance is a half the time base, uh, so I can say the frequency is 1 over, um, these, this takes up 3 squares, um, so it will be 3 centimeters multiplied by 2 to get uh, from a half a time period to a full time period. And then I'm going to multiply that by the uh, time base setting, which is 2 times 10 to the negative 5. When you plug that into a calculator, um, and we're going to round to uh, three significant figures, you get 8.3 kilohertz or 8,300 hertz. You can leave it either way you like. Part two, the intensity of the sound wave is now doubled. The frequency is unchanged. Assume that the amplitude of the trace is proportional to the amplitude of the sound wave. Sketch the new trace. Okay, um, so we're going to kind of use the same technique as before and we're going to remember that intensity is proportional to the amplitude squared. Um, so what I can say is that the new intensity over the original intensity is equal to 2. So if I do this as a straight ratio, I can say that 2 over the original intensity, which I'm just going to call 1, that also, so the ratio is 2, that is equal to the, uh, the new amplitude squared divided by the original amplitude squared. So to get the original amplitude, I need to uh, go from the center of this, which is fortunately uh, pretty easy to, to see here. Um, and that will be, set, I'm just gonna use seven. Um, I could say 1.4, uh, because it's 1.4 centimeters. But because this is a ratio, all I actually need to use is a number of squares. Um, so you, like I say, you could have had uh, 1.4 there, or in fact, anything that you chose as a scale. Um, but I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna do it as just number of small squares. Uh, so that means that a n squared is equal to two times, sorry, that should be seven squared, shouldn't it? Uh, two times seven squared which is 98. So a n, I'm just going to take the square root of it. So that's 9 point, I think 9, 8. Uh, let me just check on my calculator. Uh, no, that's the cube root, don't want that. Square root of, uh, is it 98? 7 times 49 times 2, yeah. Uh, okay, so that comes to uh, 9 point, nine so about so what i'm doing on here it's going to be about 10. Uh, so that's going to have a peak there a trough there uh oh yeah okay that peak is the same so that's going to go there um, and they're going to cross the axes at the same point because zero intensity will still be the same so about there so i'm looking for a curve that will look something like this. Um, it is important that you try and draw these uh, smoothly, or as smoothly as you can. And that's gonna come down a little bit deeper. You could in fact go and work out this exact point here where it meets the axis, but I don't think that's gonna be necessary for them. And in fact, it wasn't according to the mark scheme. Part three, the time base is now switched off. Describe the trace on the screen. So remember the time base is the one that's scrolling your, uh, your uh, trace across this way. So if it's switched off, you'll no longer get the, uh, the horizontal component of it. Instead, you'll just get the up and down component. Um, so it will appear as a vertical line. You won't get that movement from side to side. Now that was all you needed for the mark scheme, um, but I think it's probably worth uh, saying um, that it'll be a vertical line with the same amplitude because uh, the time base doesn't affect the gain, doesn't affect the y-axis. Um, so intensity is now doubled, um, so we would say 
uh, what's that? It was 10 squares, so two centimeters. Well, I say we could say four centimeters uh, total length. That would be a nice way of saying it. As I say, that wasn't required on the mark scheme, but I think it's uh, it would be worth including in, in a, if you had another question like it. Then randomly, part B, totally different type of questions. So they were being a little bit strange there. I don't know why this isn't a standalone question, but never mind. Um, we've got a beam of light of a single wavelength is instant uh, normally on a diffraction grating as illustrated below. Um, they did try to call attention to the fact this is second order, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if a few people got uh, a little bit messed up by the fact this is the second order. Um, it says it does not show all the emerging beams, so you are going to have another one uh, halfway through there that would be the first order. Terrible film. Um, Right, the grating has a line spacing of that, so good, so you're not even needing to use the lines per 100 millimeters. They've actually given you the separation there, which is decent of them. Um, so you're going to calculate the wavelength of the light. So for this one, we're going to use the equation n lambda is equal to d sine theta. Uh, we know that... Uh, n is 2, so let's, mark, let's mark this in here, so I can say that gives us n is equal to 2, uh, and we know that uh, 3 times 10 to negative 4, that is d, uh, so lambda will be equal to uh, 3.4 times 10 to the negative 6 multiplied by sine of 16 all over 2. And when you plug that into a calculator, do make sure that your calculator is in degrees mode. Again, you should get uh, 4.7 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. Um, again, this is to two significant figures. This is to two significant figures, so we're expecting an answer to two sig fig. Part two, determine the highest order emerging from the diffraction grating. So just a reminder of the theory here. Um, so you've got your first order, second order, third order, fourth order, and so on going like that. So the maximum theoretical order will occur when theta is 90 degrees. We can't diffract more than 90 degrees because then we'd be going back the way we came um, and that would be reflection rather than diffraction. So um, we're gonna get the maximum when theta is 90 degrees. That's a terrible drawing of a theta, but never mind. Uh, so to calculate that, I've got lambda now. Um, so I can say n max, uh, that is equal to d sine theta over lambda, plug in those numbers again, so you get 3.4 times 10 to the negative 6, uh, the sine of 90, which is obviously uh, uh, 1, uh, over 4.7 times 10 to the negative 7. If you kept this on your calculator, you could just use equal, or they'll um, that allow you to carry it through. Um, so that's going to give you uh, 7.2 to 7.3, depending on your rounding, um, depending on which kind of rounded figures you used here. Either way, though, we know we always have to round down for uh, the maximum order. Um, you can't round up because it's saying that in theory you'd get a 7.2 order at 90 degrees, but obviously that's not an order. The orders are always uh, integers. So you want the smallest integer that will fit, which is going to be 7. Question 6. A spring is fixed at one end and is compressed by a, applying a force to the other end. The variation in force F acting on the spring with its compression X is shown below. So we've got a compression of 0 0.045 meters. That's good. That's, there's no conversion to do there. It's produced when a force F1 acts on the spring. The spring has a spring constant of 800 newtons per meter. Determine F1. All right, well, that's quite easy. We just use Hooke's law. So F is equal to K delta L or KE, depending on how you write it, but it's just basically spring constant times extension. 
So that's going to be 800 times 0 0.045, uh, which comes out as 36 newtons. Again, uh, we've got two sig fig here. Really, only we have one sig fig here because we don't know if this zero is accurate or not. Uh, so two sig fig is good for an answer. Part 2. Use figure 3.1 to show that for a compression of 0.045 metres, the elastic potential energy of the spring is 0.81 joules. So you've got two potential uh, ways of doing it. The first one is you can say that the uh, area here is equal to the work done. So that would be a half times uh, F1 times X. Um, or you could use the equation uh, energy stored in a spring, so work done is a half kx squared. Um, now, because the f over here is a calculated value that you've worked out, um, when you have two equally good equations, it's generally better to go with uh, the one that you didn't calculate yourself um, because often in the exam well not often but they might choose not to give you uh, error carried forward if there was a way of getting the the answer to the question without using an incorrectly calculated previous part of it um, so just be aware of that as a, as a, a potential just thing to be aware of um, and also, don't forget to do don't do what I did and forget to square your uh, extension if you choose that one. Anyway, um, that comes out as 0 0.81 joules, which is what we were expecting. Part three. Uh, a children's toy uses the spring in part A to launch a ball of mass 0 0.02 kilograms. Again, good. That's uh, in a base units again, uh, vertical into the air. The ball is initially held against one end of the spring, which has a compression of 0 0.045. Notice that's the same compression as before. Uh, the spring is then released to launch the ball. The kinetic energy as it leaves the toy is 0 0.72 joules. Um, so then it says the, the toy converts the latter potential energy of the, sp uh, the spring into kinetic energy of the ball. Use the information above to calculate the percentage efficiency. So for this percentage efficiency, that is, uh, what is that? Sorry, that's the useful output over the total input multiplied by 100. Um, so our useful output, that's going to be the kinetic energy. So that's going to be 0 0.72. Um, and that's going to be divided by our total input energy. Now the springs, we've already worked out the energy in compressing the spring. That's here. So that's 0 0.81. And don't forget to multiply by 100 to convert it into a uh, percentage. Uh, so that's uh, 0 0.72 divided by 0 0.81. 1 multiplied by 100, uh, which is 88.8 recurring. So again, everything's to two sig figs. Let's give this to two sig fig. It's 89%. Part 2, determine the initial momentum of the ball as it leaves the toy. Okay, um, so initial kinetic energy is there. So what we're going to use is the kinetic energy to get the uh, velocity. Um, so we can say that the kinetic energy is a half mv squared. We can also say that momentum is equal to mass times velocity. Um, so uh, let's say that, uh, uh, what's the easiest way of doing that? Um, Yeah, you could do it by you could do it by substitution, but I'm just going to be a little bit lazy about it. Um, I'm going to say that 0 0.72 is equal to a half multiplied by 0 0.020 uh, multiplied by v squared. 
Um, so that gives me an initial velocity. Oh, that's not in the mark scheme, so let's just have to work this out myself. Okay, 0 0.72 multiplied by 2 divided by 0 0.02 and then square rooted. is uh, that's 8.49 meters per second squared um, let me just check the answer actually because yep no, that, that looks right anyway um, let's just check and then uh, momentum is 0 0.020 multiplied by that answer which is 0.02, uh, uh, which is 0 0.17 Newton seconds uh, when you round it. 0 0.17, which good is, uh, is the answer. Um, let's see if you they do to give this answer in Newton seconds. Um, this is a uh, momentum, but momentum and impulse have the same unit. Uh, Newton seconds are the same as kilogram meters per second. Uh, so you can use that as well. And last but not least, question seven. A neutron decays by emitting a beta particle. Um, so this, sorry, beta minus particle. So this is beta minus decay. Um, and what you should remember is that beta minus decay occurs when a neutron turns into a proton plus everything else. Um, how can you remember that it's a neutron turning into a proton? Well, the beta minus particle, that's negatively charged. If you remember, decays have to conserve charge. So if you're creating a negative particle from something neutral, you also are going to have to create some positive charge. Yeah, we can't have a minus one charge being created without a positive, a plus one charge to balance it out. Um, so this is going to become a one one proton um, because it has a proton number of one, mass number of one, and it is a proton. Um, a beta particle, so that is not a uh, proton or a neutron, so it's a mass number of zero, um, and it has a negative one as its proton number because it's formed from a, uh, a neutron turning into a proton, so creating a proton, so we have a minus one there. And then uh, this uh, electron antineutrino, uh, that is neither charged nor has any mass, so it's zero, zero there. Um, I've already told you the uh, the name of it, so it is an electron antineutrino. Uh, both beta minus particles, so both electrons and uh, electron antineutrinos, they are both examples of leptons. You should remember that from the particle zoo. And then you're asked for the quark structure of the neutron. So I always remember it as an up. That's like a plus, it goes up, so that's going to be a plus, um, and therefore a down is negative, so it's going to be a minus. And then you think, well, what will make, um, how do I get a plus? So the only way I'm going to have uh, a way of creating a, a plus one charge, so I've got plus two thirds and minus one third. That's just the way I do it in my head. I always remember it's a third, and um, one's a plus third and one's a negative third, and I just do it by remembering that the up is, well, one, it's bigger, um, and two, it's positive. If that works for you, fine. If you just remember it, that's up to you. Um, so we're looking for a neutron, so something that's overall uh, neutrally charged. Um, the only way I can do that is with one up uh, and two down. So up, down, down, or you have it as down, down, up. It doesn't actually matter the order that you put this, but uh, as long as you've got two downs and an up.